uh, we've had some connection issues during during this recording. But just like to apologize uh, up front um, for any kind of glitching and so forth. I think what we ought to be seeking for and building upon is our spiritual experiences. Um, if we can build a solid foundation with more and more spiritual experiences, that gets us, I, I think that that in and of itself is is our sign. We are Saints in the South, your source for gospel growth and good times. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Saints in the South, episode 237. Good to be back. Good to be with you, as always. Um, just got a quick reminder. Hit that subscribe button. Share with your friends and family, coworkers, anybody that you think would be interested. Share it on social media. Spread it on Facebook. Don't forget about our Saints in the South podcast group where uh, lots of discussion is going on. And if you are, if you always listen on the audio version, uh, you might be in the same boat with uh, Brett Peterson, as he said in our Facebook group. He says, I tried the video this week. No one looks exactly like the picture I imagined. <laughs> like, yeah, I heard their voice. That's uh, awesome. He said, he said, I like the new format. Uh, I love your news discussions. And I thought that they might be getting in the, in the way of a solid come follow me discussion. So, uh, that was kind of a, that's kind of a consensus that, that we've, that we've been getting on, on the feedback, uh, maybe try and keep the come follow me separate with our, uh, new way of new, new segments and everything. So yeah. Hey, yeah, and tune in and see if we look like our voices. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I know if I miss speak. Or if one of us says something that's not completely correct, I usually kind of put something on the screen for the video, a correction that doesn't, and that doesn't come through in the audio. So he actually, he did point out a mistake that I had made when I was talking about, I, I was talking about the words for love. And I, I said Latin, which it's actually Greek that has the different words for love. And he correctly pointed out that I misspoke that. Yep. Very well, good. Well, good job, Kenny. I mean, how appropriate that this lesson, uh, that this, Seems like a lot of stories, though, in the Book of Mormon are about this, though. But repentance. Mm. It comes up again? Again. Again and again. <laughs> again and again. It's almost like it's a continual process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah right. like instead of a one-time event. Man, that is profound, right. Joe. So let's, uh, we are in Helaman chapters 13 through 16. Uh, the title is Glad Tidings of Great Joy. The first time Samuel the Lamanite tried to share glad tidings in Zarahemla, he was rejected and cast out by the hard hearted Nephites. You might say it was as if they had built an impenetrable wall around their hearts that prevented them from receiving Samuel's message. Samuel understood the importance of the message he bore and demonstrated faith by following God's commandment that he should return again and prophesy. We've heard that story before, right? Or a mm -hmm. similar one. Like Samuel, we all encounter walls as we prepare the way of the Lord and strive to follow his prophets. Like that word. And like Samuel, we too bear witness of Jesus Christ, who surely shall come and invite all to believe on his name. Not everyone will listen, and some may actively oppose us. But those who believe in this message with faith in Christ find that it truly is a message of glad tidings of great joy. Mm -hmm. And with that, who would like to start off? Um, I'm, I'm going to start closer to the end there. Um, Helaman 16, uh, verse 23. And notwithstanding the signs and the wonders which were wrought among the people of the Lord and the many miracles which they did. Satan did get great hold upon the hearts of the people, upon all the face of the land. And the, the verses preceding that, and I'm not going to read verse for verse, but the verses preceding that kind of give the hard-hearted people's explanation of their, it is not reasonable that if Christ comes, that he doesn't come here first, or, you know, that he's born mm -hmm. some distant land away. And, and um, it's, it's just a foolish tradition. And, 
There's the, all these different things. It's just happenstance that these aren't really miracles and things like that. Samuel prophesied that we might know of the coming of Jesus Christ, that ye might know of the signs of his coming to the intent that ye might believe on his name. It is not reasonable that such a being as a Christ shall come. This is a wicked tradition which has been handed down unto us by our fathers. The time is past, and the words of Samuel are not fulfilled. I find it, I find it interesting because so many times uh, we as people uh, and people we know want some sort of sign, want some sort of miracle, want some sort of proof. But very clearly we see in, in these verses that even with the things that they've asked for, they refuse to believe. So it's, it's not, those signs and miracles are traditionally not great for converting, but, but tend to be very good at solidifying um, an, an already pre-existing testimony or commitment. Um, and so the, the people that were already converted, the people that are already in the right path, were seeing angels and were partaking in these miracles, either receiving them or, or, or kind of being the, the giver of them, uh, so to speak. Uh, the conduit of them maybe is a better way to phrase it. But again, I, I find that no no matter what, no matter what miracle is done, that Satan has a way of twisting and turning and convincing people to, to work themselves out of it, uh, to not believe, to instead uh, harden their heart and put up walls and, and do those things um, and move further away. Uh, but I thought that was an interesting takeaway that, that that's, uh, you know, you would think that, well, if there's a miracle there, then everyone's going to believe, but that's, that's not how it goes. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's important too, because these Helaman chapters, this, this is before Christ come, uh, Christ comes to the Americas, right. And visits these, the people there. And this is kind of set up as a, as a type for, for our time. These chapters are the, the, the kind of the mirror of our time. And if you read these chapters and you see similarities, uh, I think that's important. And it's important to recognize the time you are in and to hear our prophets say, these are no longer the latter days. These are the last days before Christ comes. And it's very similar to the message that Samuel has given through these chapters. And Helaman's even been given in the chapters before and all the secret combinations and the wars, all these things. Uh, there, there are echoes in, in time. And I think there are lessons to be learned from that. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. So kind of my thought uh, on, on that with the, you know, seeking, seeking for signs. Um, I think what we ought to be seeking for and building upon uh, as an, as a direct opposite of that is our spiritual experiences. Um, if we can build a solid foundation with more and more spiritual experiences, um, that gets us, I, I think that, that in and of itself is, is our sign. Having those spiritual experiences, those spiritual confirmations, taking those experiences and, and adding them to our, to our storehouse, our spiritual storehouse, Growing. right? Yes. Growing, I think. I think it's. I, I think of it like um, somebody. If we only knew someone that exercised regularly and was really into health and fitness and stuff, of like building muscle, right? Like that. It's not. It's not something you you put on. It's something you create. You build. You grow it. Mm -hmm. um, it's same like rings on a tree, right? It's a slow and steady process, and um, or Alma's seed that you nourish and it grows and it bears fruit. I mean, those are all applicable, I think. And you're right. It's not just a, a miracle over there. It's a process of you becoming. And I think Rogue Bishop has talked about that before. It's not uh, a destination. It's it's becoming um, something different yeah, through not those a spiritual experiences. Event. Right. Yeah. And read, read the beginning of that, of that verse again, please. Uh, verse 23, and notwithstanding the signs and the wonders which were wrought among the people of the Lord and the many miracles which they did. Satan did get great hold upon the hearts of the people upon all the face of the land. Okay, so speaking of uh, Satan getting great hold upon uh, the, the people, uh, one of my favorite analogies uh, given by my, my mother is that of uh, a, a vine called morning glory um, mm -hmm. and how, how 
how it just creeps and creeps and creeps. And before you know it, it has absolutely taken over if you haven't, if you haven't addressed it Mm -hmm. and, and, and how, how, uh, how, how strong it can be, um, how thick it can be and just, uh, how overwhelming it can be if if you don't address it at uh, when, when when you when you first start seeing it, the way we address our spiritual morning glory is by seeking out those the, those spiritual experiences. It's like yeah, and I, uh, and, uh, I'll add to that that you know Satan, the devil, he, as soon as you have one of those experiences, immediately he's going to try to convince you that it wasn't what you thought it was, that it was, that it was dumb. It was stupid. And that it was just you imagining things. And, and he Mm -hmm. always tries, it's like almost immediately tries to get you to start doubting. So, Mm -hmm. you know, check yourself on that too. Uh, Make sure that when those doubts and those thoughts come into your mind, realize where they're coming from. They're not coming from you. And they're certainly not coming from God. They're coming from the adversary who wants you to, doubt yourself. He wants you to turn your back on those experiences and count them for naught. So when you have those, just recognize where they're coming from. It's, it's like uh, kudzu. You mentioned morning glory. I was thinking kudzu, mm-hmm. you know, the, right. the vine that swallowed the south, mm-hmm. they say. I don't know. I like it, though. I, I tell people, if you don't like kudzu, just wait. It'll grow on you. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I liked how right out of the Ox here. Um, <clears throat> Samuel was was calling the people to repentance in no um, uncertain terms. He was he was speaking very boldly, and uh, something that was really interesting to me is you know how we often we kind of um, we, we we have this fondness for the past. You know we kind of see the past through rose colored glasses. Mm-hmm. You know, well, you know back in my day things were different. And, you know, he, he addresses this. He said, you know, you, you, you people keep saying, well, you know, if this had been back in my time, then we, I, we wouldn't have cast out the prophets. We wouldn't have mocked them and blah, blah, blah. But then he comes and says, look, you guys are even worse. Behold, mm-hmm. ye are even worse than they, in verse 26. For as the Lord liveth, if a prophet come among you and declareth unto you a word of the Lord with testifieth of your sins and iniquities, you're angry with him cast him out and then he goes on to say that if but if somebody comes to you and they're saying all kinds of nice things like hey everything's cool just just love everybody everything's okay then you, then you're going to be okay with it you know basically you don't want someone to preach the truth to you you don't want to be called to repentance and and he really he really lays into him and in verse 29 he says, O oh, ye wicked and ye perverse generation, ye hardened and ye stiff-necked people, how long will ye suppose that the Lord will suffer you? Yea, how long will ye suffer yourselves to be led by foolish and blind guides? Yea, how long will ye choose darkness rather than light? So he was he was being pretty harsh with him. And obviously the people were upset. You know, the people had already kicked him out once. <laughs> you know, then they, they found him in the town again and they threw him out one more time. And they were like, listen, you, you don't ever, ever come back. Did we not cast you out? <sighs> Next time, we will not be so kind. And... I got to give props to uh, script gems as always, because you know I get all of my good ideas from them, so I, I steal them from them. But um, they shared a quote. They shared a quote that was really, really good from uh, uh, President Ezra Taft Benson. He said, "Quote: As a prophet reveals the truth, it divides the people. The honest in heart heed his words, but the unrighteous either ignore the prophet or fight him." When the prophet mm. points out the sins of the world, the world either want to close the mouth of the prophet or else act as if the prophet didn't exist, rather than repent of their sins. Popularity is never a test of truth. Many a prophet has been killed or cast out. As we come closer to the Lord's second coming, you can expect that as the people of the world become more wicked, the prophet will be less popular with them. Yeah, I think we're definitely seeing that. 
we're seeing mm-hmm. you know, as it as it is today. You know, President Nelson, he could say anything. He could come out and he can come out and say, you know what, I I really like Dr. Pepper. And man, the there'll be Twitter will be blowing up with people talking about what a monster he is. <laughs> or or he could tell everybody how much he loves them and they're like, How dare he express yeah, exactly. that to me? I yes. did not invite no. him to share those feelings with me. Who does he think he is? It's just ridiculous. Exactly. That's exactly correct. I was and thinking it's so, that too. Like, go ahead. I was just thinking the same thing. Like I, I was trying to envision actually President Nelson saying, you know, from the podium and general conference, oh, you wicked and you perverse <laughs> generation, you know, like, but, you know, broadcast for the world or whatever. I mean, that's what the prophets, you know, at times that's what they're called to do. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's within the realm of possibility, but it's just hard to imagine him because he is. And that's, that's the interesting thing. He is still castigated as, you know, one of those old white men and old foolish traditions and those types of things. And yet he is the most loving person. He's the he's the the, the soft gloves when it comes to encouraging you to repent and encouraging you to to do to do better, to be better. You know, mm-hmm. I heard somebody um, relate this verse to um, snipe hunting. You ever been snipe hunting? <laughs> Y'all, y'all ever mm-hmm. fell for These that, are back right? in the days yeah. of Boy, Boy Scouts of America campouts. That's right. That's right. Back so for those day. of you that don't know, you get sw- you get uh, snookered into uh, snipe hunting. You get a bag or a pillowcase or something like that. And it's, it's I remember when I a, got um, my first snipe. It was a good one. It was big. <laughs> yeah. It was a big yeah. snipe. It's ginormous. And um, so that it's usually it's a it's kind of a rite of passage. It's like light hazing, you might even say, to where the older boys will convince a younger boy to come on out and hold that bag in the nighttime, and they're gonna scare up some of these snipes, these birds that, that they don't fly, and you'll catch them, and it's great fun, and they're delicious to eat, and there's huge stories that go along with it, and it's a bit of the emperor's new clothes kind of thing, to where everyone seems to be going along with this thing, so it must be true, but in reality, there's no such thing as a snipe. You're just out there waiting, usually by yourself, in the dark, getting cold and scared, and there's no snipes coming. There's no such thing as a snipe, and you, you've you just been had. Well, and everybody else and, is um, sitting around the campfire yet laughing, laughing at you. <laughs> yeah. So I think it was Ben Wilcox was, uh, was kind of uh, relating this to snipe hunting in that when you follow the ways of the world, you're trying to find joy where it does not and cannot exist. Mm-hmm. You cannot have last, lasting joy without God and you cannot return to God without the savior. And so anything that's distracting you off of that path is snipe hunting. So when you hear the news and the famous movie stars and all that stuff, it's just people saying, Hey, come hold this bag and stand out here. It's great fun. You're going to love it. These snipes are fantastic. And that's what you should recognize it as. It's just snipe hunting. Oh, it was amazing. Mm-hmm. Also that, as the arrows and the stones wouldn't hit Samuel, they couldn't hit him, you know, mm-hmm. that what, what was their first inclination? Not not everybody. But, they they you know, said he's least, under the power of the devil. The devil, yeah. you know, it's like, <laughs> isn't that ironic? Like, well, yeah, isn't it? You know, and when Christ was healing, right, what did they say about him? Yeah, the devil. He him, the yeah, he's, he's, he's healing by the power of the devil. And it's like, why would the devil use his power to cast out himself. Right. So I'm casting out a devil by using the devil's power. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's right. the same thing to me when people say that the Book of Mormon was was inspired by the devil. I'm like, dude, you you must think the devil's really, really dumb because if the devil yeah. is encouraging people, encouraging to repent, people to give their lives to, repent, to Jesus Christ, yes, and have to repent yeah. and have faith in Jesus Christ, he's not doing a very good job of being a devil. I always <laughs> tell people I would be a terrible devil. I would be absolutely terrible, absolutely terrible, terrible. I, devil. I would have, I, because I would have given up a long time ago, and I said, like, you know what? I don't care. I'm never going to get a body, but I'm not doing this. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna go try to help all these people get back to God. I'd be terrible at it. Terrible. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the 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 thing about Satan creating the Book of Mormon is that he's very he's very deceiving, right? He he doesn't just come out and just say, you know, this is this is uh this is the way I want you to go, right? So we we are accused of worshiping a different Jesus, right? Yeah, that's right. So so I they say so he set up this he set up this Book of Mormon, right, to make us worship a different Jesus. Yeah, get us a different distracted. Jesus. That's right. Our <laughs> yeah, that's Mormon hilarious. Jesus. 
Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Like, I, I noticed I too. Tell people like, look, hey, this isn't Milton can't, Bear. You can't, you, everybody can't just have their own Jesus. That's not how this mm. works. So I found it amazing that um, almost every time we study one of these Come Follow Me lessons, repentance is talked about over and over and over again. Do you think maybe it's important? You know, it's, I would say so. I mean, necessary and important. It kind of seems to be a reoccurring theme. <laughs> it's yeah. Like a major step in the plan of salvation, the plan of happiness. Yeah. Like, like, like you can't get there without it, right? Mm -hmm. The thing that really took hold of me this time was when it, the lesson pointed out that how how is repentance different than just changing your behavior? Mm -hmm. And then my mind went to different things about growing up and, and remembering the scriptures that we read and the scriptures that we were told and talked about in classes and stuff where, you know, if you're going to give a bad gift— and you already give a gift grudgingly or you do service grudgingly, it would be better that you hadn't given the gift at all. And I'm like, okay, then I want to give it. I'm good. I'm good with that. You know, <laughs> but I think, I think that the, what, what we missed in the early days when we were talking about that, that seems to be more relevant to me today or make more sense to me today is it really doesn't matter if you do start out giving service begrudgingly. I, I, I can't tell you how many times that I'm heading over, to go do something on a Saturday night, uh, again, uh, five weeks in a row, you know, thinking about maybe doing something else different, but I'm going to go anyway. And I have a little bit of a hard time. I have my, my attitude isn't quite right, but mm -hmm. I don't think that by continuing to go and do that means it would have been better that to just stay home and not serve at all or not be of service. Right. Because you can change, your heart can change. And I think that's the point that they're trying to, to make in that scripture is that if you give service and nothing changes within you and you still have the bad attitude when you're done and you still don't feel good about what you've done and you still think it was a waste of time, then yes, it would have been better for you not to go. But if during that service you find a love for the person or people that you're serving and your heart starts to change and the Holy Ghost works within you and someone comes up to, to you and just with tears thanking you for what you've done and it moves you to tears because you realize, man, I really started this out with a bad attitude. <laughs> then you're doing, you're okay, right? You shouldn't think of yourself as bad, and you shouldn't think that your service was bad or wouldn't be counted in heaven towards you for something good or towards this person for good because you changed, which is what repentance is anyway. It's changing. Mm. But the other thing that it pointed out was that how is it different than just changing your behavior, right? How is it different than just changing your behavior? Well, to me, I think, just my thoughts, is the change of behavior is the beginning. As we start to change our behavior, you know, that I think it's a great start. I, I don't think that we should look at that like, well, I'm, I'm not really repenting if I'm just changing my behavior. Well, because if you're, if you're actually trying to change your behavior, it means that you're exercising the steps of repentance and you're exercising the steps of faith. You're starting out with just a desire. You can no more than desire to believe. And then that desire moves up to belief. Now you're starting to believe. And then that belief works in you until it becomes faith. And then that mm. faith works in you until it becomes knowledge. And then you mm. don't need faith in that one thing because you have knowledge in it. And then that knowledge moves to expectation. So I think that the change of behavior, it's more than just a change of behavior. And it's what we've talked about before. It's becoming. Mm -hmm. Let that change of behavior, behavior become a catalyst within you to actually change your whole being, to become and start becoming. It's a never-ending process of becoming better, more exalted, more celestial, more like Christ, more in tune with the Holy Ghost. It's, the, it's like that favorite word, Joe, that you were talking about before, striving. That's Love right. that word. Love, Love striving. It. Striving Absolutely. to me is the, it's the, the epitome. epitome. Striving is the epitome of, of repentance. It's, mm -hmm. it's, the, it's, it's what makes it happen. It's what makes it possible. 
Michael, can yeah, I, I think- share that? Actually, what you're saying, I, I do have a, another quote um, from Lay it on us, Kenny. Taft Benson. Exactly, exactly on what you're just saying right now. Uh, he said, quote, repentance means more than simply a reformation of behavior. Many men and women in the world demonstrate great willpower and self-discipline in overcoming bad habits and the weaknesses of flesh. Yet, at the same time, they give no thought to the master, sometimes even openly rejecting him. Such changes of behavior, even if in a positive direction, do not constitute true repentance. True repentance is based on and flows from faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other way. True repentance involves a change of heart and not just a change of behavior. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's exactly what you were just saying. Yeah. And and, and, cool. and and everybody take it to heart, right? That it can still start with change behavior. But if that's where you stop, if that if if you don't go further than that, mm-hmm. right. That, you, that, you missed it. You missed, you missed it. Part you missed of it. it. Yeah. Right. You missed it. That let that change of behavior it. work in you until, like Kenny was pointing out, that the spirit can take over and Jesus Christ can come into your life. Uh, so I was listening to a the show the other day, and guy was talking about kind of a, a spiritual change that 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 he went through. Um, and so I'm going to reference a behavior. That, that he pointed out about himself. Um, but it was, it was a deeper, it, it was something that, that he didn't even think about doing. And when he realized that he had done what he did, he, he, he accepted and realized that he was really changing from within. Mm. Because, uh, so what he talked about was, is that he was walking along the sidewalk somewhere and he he saw some 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 trash, uh, and instead of walking by it, uh, he said never never ever had he done this before. Instead of walking by it, he stopped, went over, picked it up, and went and put it in the trash can. But he didn't realize that he had done that until almost as if he was when he was leaving the walking away from the trash can, and it, and all of a sudden it just dawned on him. He's like. I've never done that before in my entire life. <laughs> I've never had a desire to do it. And whenever I saw the trash on the ground, it was, I, I didn't even think about it. I just went over and just, and just did it. And so mm-hmm. it, you know, the, the, the change in ourselves almost becomes a, almost kind, kind of a sixth sense. We, we just do things because, because that's who we are. Right. We, we don't have to think about, Mike, we talked about the, 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 the service project. Uh, yes, sometimes we, we don't feel like it and everything. But I, but if we're if if we I think if we always have those feelings of like, man, I got to go do another service project, I got to go participate in this, then then we, we've got some issues. Now, if that's just every once in a while because we've got a, a stacked week or we've done it three Saturdays in a row or something like that, um, I think we, we, we may have to check ourselves a little bit. But. If we are service project, yeah, sounds good. Let's let's go do it, and and you don't even think twice about it. That's that's more of, of who who you are as an individual, rather than if if you think to yourself every time like, dang, another service project, another mm-hmm. service project, right? I don't know if it's this way for y'all, but uh, this this is perfectly encapsulated in tracting as a missionary. Like I never wanted to do tracting. <laughs> like it was. Um, I had to kind of work, I had to work myself up to go do it. But whenever I did it, like first door you knock, it just felt, it felt better. It felt like you were in the right place. You're meeting people like you've been sent there and stuff like that. But almost every time you have to kind of convince yourself, okay, all right, we got to go knock some doors or whatever. Now, granted, my mission didn't have a whole lot of tracking anyway. So that might be part of it too. That was just kind of one, one piece. But some people will say, in, in kind of the learning and growing in life, there's this phrase I've heard many times, it's fake it until you make it. Mm-hmm. Like if you just do it long enough or enough times that you're going to eventually get there. But I, I really would change that to faith it until you make it. Because if you have some undergirding foundation of belief that wa- that even though you don't want to do it, you have the discipline. You're, you're, you're showing your faith in doing it anyway 
because you know it's right even if you don't feel like you want to do it that day. And then when you do that, you do make it. And it does change your heart. I think you do have those experiences where the other person's heart is touched and they're brought to tears and then you're brought to tears and you have this overwhelming confirmation that you did the right thing, that you're on the right path, and then it changes you. And you become the type of person that picks up trash on the side of the road because you can't pass it up. Or, or puts the carts back in the Walmart parking lot. That's right. Yes. Yeah, some people <laughs> don't. A bunch of heathens. And Can I, I tell you, from my Just experience, to clarify, the buggy. Yeah, the bu- the buggy's it's not a car. Yeah. It's a cart. It's a buggy. <laughs> it's a but buggy. It, every time I've been asked to, to go out with the missionaries, um, Every single time, it's like, oh, oh gosh, yeah, I'll do it, and it's like, uh, and I really don't want to, but every single time, without a single exception, when I have, I'm so glad I did. Mm-hmm. It is, right. su- you know, I have such right. powerful spiritual experiences. Yes. Man. So that's so true. You meet that is the coolest so true. people and have the most awesome conversations with people, and I'm like, I'm so glad I did this. <laughs> Faith it until oh, yeah. you make it. Faith there you right. go. So, so, so that that's a perfect example of what I was talking about with the service project, right? So, so, what what does that mean? Because I, I'm similar to you, Kenny. Um, yes, I'm I'm willing to go, but when I get that call from the missionaries, is it? Do I have that first thought? Heck, of it. All right, it's, you know, do it. Do I really have time for this? Yeah, I know I need to. Yeah. You know, so I mean, what what what, what does that mean? What I mean, what, what what does it mean? To me, it means you're human. Welcome to earth. Okay. (laughs) Well, welcome to mortality. And you are, you are here in this great, big, huge world spinning 3000 miles an hour so that you can learn. But every time, like, when when, when am I going to learn that? How how do you know that that I have spiritual experiences every single time I go out? Right. How, How do you know you're not already learning? How long is it going to take me to learn that? I'm just saying, how do you know you're not already learning? Well, yeah. Pe- I mean. People have the hardest time when they look in the mirror, right? If they're trying to lose weight, they'll see big differences right away. But then as it starts to become slower, they can't see the changes. But their spouse or someone else that, that's close to them, they can see the changes. Maybe, Jackson, if you analyzed it, before, this is how big that reservation was and how long it lasted. And then over time, ever so slowly, that reservation starts shrinking and it doesn't last as long. As long as you're going in the right direction and progressing, you're striving. So my, my guess is, sir, <laughs> that you it's just going so slow that you can't see it, which is line by line. Precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. I bet you are progressing and you just can't see it. So give yourself that's, a break. Well, no, that's that makes sense read. because I think we want to be like, we want to be like, okay, I'm excited to go. Like, that's right. I don't want to call. I'm getting tired up. I want to be like, yes. But that's like, that's like going to the gym and being like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be jacked. I'm gonna go. That's right. I'm gonna look. Just go. I'm gonna look like Jackson to yeah, death. Listen, that now I do feel like that about the gym. I mean, I want to go every single day. I'm gonna do two a days, man. Well, there you go. <laughs> why, 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 why can't I feel like that all the time with service projects and going out with the missionaries and doing my ministering visits and reading my scriptures and going to church and fulfilling my calling and everything? Right. I, 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 I know the answer. I, I, I know the answer. Oh, really? But, What's the answer? But it, it's, it, I mean, it's <laughs> what, the is answer it? is what is what you gave. <laughs> but I, I'm asking for all of our listeners out there, you know, at, at, at some point, hopefully, I'm excited when I get that phone call from the missionaries. Hopefully. Hey, right? I'm going to text them. I'll text them right now. <laughs> hey, I need you to the call. Spirit you. is willing, but yeah. flesh is weak. That's right. That's absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Uh, last last topic. Samuel the Lamanite. He climbed up on that wall, right? So in honor of Samuel the Lamanite climbing up on that wall, I'm going to share something with you. Okay. One of the greatest 
movies of all time. Okay. Oh. Can you tell me? Can, can you tell me what I'm about to share? The, uh, one of the greatest on, movies of on. all time. Like, was it put out by the church or just? No, no. Oh. This is oh. this is rated R and everything, so it's not put oh, out by it? the church. Oh, because yeah. I would say one of the greatest movies of all time would be. Um, um, a few good men. I was thinking uh, a few good men. That wouldn't be mine. I was thinking McClintock with uh, you know John Wayne. Mine so would be is, the, mine would be the man from Snowy River. Oh, so so this is uh, about a seven second clip here, and if you haven't seen a few good men, it is a it is a great movie. But he's in a courtroom. This is a, a general here, and uh, he is being tried for incorrectly um, fulfilling his duty. And so this is his response, one of his responses. So Jack Nicholson is one of the greatest actors of all time. That's right. Absolutely. All right, here we go. Epic. Places you don't talk about at parties. You want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. You want me on that wall. You need me on that wall, right? Mm -hmm. Let's see here. Um, Samuel the Lamanite was willing to get up there on that wall. And at first he had left, right? And then he was told to, mm -hmm. uh, to, 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 to go back and he was willing to do that. Um, and so it should, hopefully it provides us, all of us courage, right? What, what wall do we have in our lives? What wall do we need to stand up on? Uh, Joe shared, uh, last week about in the church news the 10-year anniversary when elder bednar uh talked about um uh, flooding the earth flooding, with, flooding the earth right with, with social with media messages. right that's right mm -hmm. yep so maybe maybe your first wall that you climb up on is a is is a post on facebook a share in a scripture you know or wh whatever it is uh Samuel the Lamanite was instructed to share the good word of God, to call people to repentance. Now, maybe your call isn't to call people to repentance, but maybe it is to, to share something uh, faith promoting. Um, and I think we have a, a, a wonderful example in Samuel the Lamanite and being willing to get up on that wall. So the challenge for all of us and all the listeners out there is to find a, find a wall, uh, so to speak, in your life, to climb up on, find the faith, to climb up on it, and uh, and shout something from the top of that wall there. So, and take a lot of courage because Samuel the Lamanite in that moment, I'm sure he 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 had faith that if the Lord was going to ask him to do that, that the Lord would protect him. But those things are never guaranteed. Sometimes the right. Lord asks us to do things, and and we 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 don't come out alive on the other end of it. You know, some yeah, you know, that's. Get Sometimes canceled, we man. are asked to make the ultimate sacrifice. And for all he knew, Samuel could have been, that could have been the moment in his life where he was asked to make the ultimate sacrifice. And he was willing to do right. it. Yeah. I, um, it, it's, I think it's key to note that in some of the later verses, he, he jumped down from the wall. So sometimes we look at the artwork and it looks like a 40 foot wall. Yeah. And you go, well, <laughs> right. You know, that was quite well, a jump. <laughs> yeah. Not only that, but I think in your mind, you go, well, some of those arrows could have missed. I mean, that's a pretty long shot and it's, you know, the upward angle and stuff like that. But the reality is it's, it's probably a much lower wall. It's probably, yeah. you know, no, no higher than the first level of your house. I if know, he's able it to just Samuel jump down off of it. It was Samuel, the bionic man. Right, exactly. Jumping off a forty but, foot, forty foot wall, forty foot wall, and just bouncing. Yeah. But the did, did, thing did, is, did, 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 is he's probably on a much lower wall that would have been a much easier shot, and they yeah, couldn't oh, make yeah. it. It was significant enough that people were converted on the fact that they couldn't hit him. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's important, I think, to note because, as Jackson was saying, sharing these positive messages and things and speaking up for the church, for the gospel, for Jesus. Sometimes you have to get more on eye level than you might be comfortable with. Um, and, and you can't rely on the distance to protect you from the arrows. You have to rely on the Lord. The, the, the video in the gospel library is really awesome because there's a little two second part where it shows the archers practicing and every one of them are hitting the bullseye dead on, you know, like the generals are walking by and he's like, they never miss. 
You never miss. They hit the bullseye every time, yet they couldn't hit this man standing six or eight feet off the ground on top of a wall. Yep. It says a lot. That's funny. They practice and practice, but Samuel never got the point of all that. <laughs> <laughs> Two check marks. That's right. Exactly. Uh, I think oftentimes people think there's enough people already sharing, right? Mm -hmm. what, is, what, 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 what is my voice going to do? What is my small voice going to do? Well, what it does is, is that it adds to the light, the goodness that is being shared. We know that evil is being shared and spread. And so I say, take that courage and, and share it. So, Oh, absolutely. Um, when, um, when I was uh, still a rogue bishop, that's when the brethren came out and said, hey, testimonies need to be two Ooh. minutes tops. But in fact, let's get it down to one minute. You can say a lot in 30 seconds. And I remember thinking, Man, this is going to be one long fast and testimony <laughs> meeting. Yeah. If that's if, because th two or three people will get up and sit down and like, mm, you know, crickets will be chirping. Right. I was amazed at what happened. I was, and my testimony was made even stronger because more people than ever got up to bear their testimony. It was nonstop. People I hadn't heard from in years got up. And you know why? You know what they said? Because they didn't feel like that they had to beat so-and-so and come up with this huge, profound story. And they didn't have this overwhelming experience that happened to them that week. They could just go up and share their pure testimony and sit down, and it was okay. And I'm yeah. telling you that what, what you were saying, Jackson— it doesn't matter if everyone got up and said the exact same thing. That message is going to hit differently with every person that hears it. It's going to be different from every person that says it. You know, so one person may really resonate with you in the way they uh, give up and get up and give a testimony about the very same thing could just really strike your heart. Right. Other than someone else. Right. So and you never know. You never know who you're going to touch or who the spirit is going to touch because of you. So I agree 100 percent, 100 percent, you know, just open your mouth. So you're endorsing Jackson going on exchanges with the missionaries. That's right. It. That's great. I, that's I, I, give me a call, I guess, baby. I'll be ready. I guess, I guess if that's what you got out of that, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> Share your testimony. You never know who you're going to touch. I mean, that's it. So I, I, don't, don't, I, 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 I try not to touch anyone. I don't. No touch <laughs> Everybody's anyone. leaving here that Jackson hates going out with the missionaries. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Joe. Thanks for that. <laughs> That's the main takeaway yeah. here. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That was that was point number twelve on the lesson from Come Follow right. Me. Was. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Well, uh, speaking of points, we will bring those points to a close. Until next time, y'all keep on striving. Come on.